செய்வது and there are two ways I'd like to do it. One is to assume that you all know about the final track, or the final voluntary movements. Is that a reasonable assumption? And that you all know about the crossed sensory ascending pathways, final climate track in particular. Um, We'll come to those in more detail later in the course. We'll talk about uh, supersegmental structures uh, specifically. Uh, but it helps to have some of these uh, major motor and sensory tracks in mind when we review the brain stem. Um, let's uh, start at the top with the midbrain. And then come down into the uh, anterior hindbrain with the uh, midline, fourth ventricle, the vascular groove and middle pedicle. Separate off tegmentum and basis. Do the same for the middle hindbrain. Your hind brain segment. Nine. Let me And then a spinal cord segment. Uh, I'll reach here. Term that says we have an ipsilateral cranial nerve and a 
comes from that from Fiji. The two sides alternate. And that, of course, implies, you know, that hemiplegia results from a transection of the corpuspinal tract, which is coming down from the forebrain, internal capsules, or just your feet on cold ponds, crossing, running down in the spinal cord, uh, something like so, it's coming down here, ponds, crossing, like that. And of course, in the various horizontal sections we have here, these fibers are in the middle of the tip of the uncle. Basis pontus. Basis pontus. Primal tract. And crossed out here on the lateral board. A little piece. The cranial nerves that come out towards the midline, near the midline, are the ones you would expect to be involved with these descending fibers. Those are going to be the third nerve. The sixth nerve. And the twelfth nerve. easy progression to remember, 3, 6, and 12. Uh, these are the nerves that come out straight ventrally, have their nuclei immediately placed. And come out very near uh, the primal tract, even through it, and very near it here. So that no matter where one intersects this descending corticospinal tract, cortex, capsule, peduncle, pons, pyramid, spinal cord, you get a paralysis of the appropriate uh, limbs below that level with hyperactive reflexes and incisi and all that. But how to tell where in this long course the lesion actually is, because the lesion up here in the cortex or capsule could very easily just involve the leg area and give a monophagia, this is on the spinal cord, below the cervical segments. But when there's a long stretch of nervous system to worry about where the lesion might be. But if you can find a third nerve palsy, Ipsilateral to the lesion, contralateral to the hemiplegia. You know the lesion is at the level of the brain. If you have a six nerve palsy, ipsilateral to the lesion and contralateral to the hemiplegia, you know it's in the middle of the brain segment. But if you have a twelfth nerve palsy, ipsilateral to the lesion, contralateral to the hemiplegia, you know it's in the posterior hymen. Any problems on, on those? The next group of syndromes involves that of cruciate hemihypogesia.
And these relate to ascending sensory pathways, specifically spinal thalamic tract, coming from what part of the secondary? One more time. Spinal thalamic tract, coming from what cells in the segment? Well, they start as small fibers. Uh, go out there, have a small fiber system come in, branch in this track. The service track. Secondary collaterals off to what nucleus, Steve? How many layers does it have, Ray? Yes, to the mark. Mark now. Right. And the last element gives rise to fibers that ascend and cross. Right up to thalamus. As a spinal thalamic tract. And as they ascend, uh, having crossed at the spinal level, or second you hear it. We have this uh, laminated nucleus, the last of which gives rise by the cross, and go up. Thalamus as the spinal thalamic tract coming from small fibers for pain temperature for the opposite side of the body. But anywhere one interrupts those, one will have a loss of pain temperature on the opposite side of the body. The corresponding system for the brain stem, small fibers, major hindbrain, descending in the descending or spinal tract of the trigeminal, giving off secondary collaterals, which in the caudal third anyway are exactly oriented like the uh, three layers here. And they cross and ascend up to the thalamus also. That's the trigeminal thalamic tract. And where these overlap, Brain down to C1. We're going to have ipsilateral loss of pain temperature in the face and a contralateral loss of pain temperature in the body. And that makes an X shaped pattern, which gives the cruciate is half the whole body in an X shaped fashion. Decrease in pain. Uh, junction of C1, C2, even in the C2, the ophthalmic division. So one can expect to find within this couple of inches of caudal brain stem a lesion that will produce that as the major clinical sign. Small lesion, there shouldn't be any encroachment on the thalamic tract system or on the medial cranial nerves. One now has to consider the lateral cranial nerves. So, in the anterior hindbrain, we 
other word which is five. Coming out laterally. Put these sending sensory systems in. Uh, put in the primary one first. The uh, small fiber system coming in. This level running right angles to the board. Coming down. Membranes and overlapping here with the spinal system in this hour. In fact, out of the very subtle region of the spinal cord. And the nucleus, laminated, marginal, lacnosa, propheus, and the crossing fibers. And over to ascend. Through the middle anterior brain brain and the uh, brain sec sections. Why does it cruciate again? Because if you got in the assembly area, it seems like you would lose pain temperature both from the contralateral face down and the contralateral bottom. Right. That's a variation on the theme that we'll come to in a moment. Uh, but the primary smallest lesion would be catching just these two systems as they're right next to each other. Um, cross fiber coming up here on the other side. And um, so you have the possibility of these uh, just being caught with almost nothing else. <coughs> So beginning at the top of the region, we can have the, and anything above the anterior hindbrain is not going to involve the descending tract. So you can't get the face on the wrong side. If you get a sensory syndrome, it'll be completely crossed. Face, arm, and leg. The ipsilateral face can only come from anterior hindbrain or below. So we have the fifth nerve, and in the middle hindbrain segment, the seventh nerve, in the posterior hindbrain segment, Sensory systems going in also for the eighth nerve. Uh, cochlear and vestibular components for the ninth and tenth cranial nerves. We also have sensory components. Um, and uh, But one can look at the cranial nerves coming out laterally as providing local signatures 
pit or the seventh or the ninth. And in theory, the eleventh. Not running outside. So within this approximately two inches of caudal brain, brain stem, one can look for a local signature. So where within that brain stem lesion really is. The commonest is going to be here in the region of the ninth and tenth cranial nerves. <coughs> One will have typically involvement of vocal cords, hoarseness, particularly in swallowing. But one can have facial. The rarest probably is the anterior segment itself. There are movements as well as loss of pace. Sensation comes in. Uh, equally rare would be the 11th, which would be caused usually by say, an aneurysm or something of the vertebral artery catching the 11th nerve out in the cervical space, as well as uh, pressing on the caudal uh, muscle of the fellow of C1. Any questions about that at this point? Now, of course, these two syndromes are most commonly related to blood vessels, vascular disease. You can see them in tumors. Tumors are a little more sloppy, though, in terms of, worrying, of, of picking up particular fields. But it happens that the blood vessels in the brain stem, two vertebral arteries out here, Give rise to paramedian branches that come in, supplying the pyramid and the hypoglossal, and more lateral branches that go out to supply the cerebellum and give rise to penetrating branches that come in laterally, dorsal laterally. The same basic pattern is seen in all of the brain stem sections. So we have much more neatly for the neurologist and for the neurosurgeon, a strong tendency for division between these two syndromes, predominantly sensory, predominantly motor. The basic principle is the same of having a local signature from the third to the twelfth cranial nerves uh, as part of this uh, overall pattern. Now, this has been known for 150 years or more, and Sigmund Freud, when he was just a neuropathologist, as he said, quotation marks, uh, his fame was actually that of a clinical neurologist, able to localize brainstem lesions on essentially this basic principle. So any problem at this point? Well, the second way I'd like to approach the summary of the segmental structures is to consider some of the intersegmental reflexes. Uh, we have uh, considered the posterior hindbrain essentially by itself in relation to the various vital reflexes from heart, lungs, and GI tract that involve posterior hindbrain and spinal cord uh, segments. And uh, I don't choose to review those at the moment, but um, let's consider the next higher segment, middle hindbrain. 
where I didn't quite do justice to the vestibular system. And this is going to become increasingly important as we get into the cerebellum. So in the uh, middle hind brain segment, we have the vestibular nucleus receiving primary sensory input, bipolar cells of the uh, gravity system, from what part of the vestibular apparatus, Mike? Neutrical, where we have hair cells and otoliths pressing down on them, so we have a, a means of recognizing whether we're going up or down in relation to gravity. Seen in a in a uh, put another product already. Let's put another view up here. Three with three uncles, arms, midline, pyramid, olive, olive spinal cord. Division there between the anterior and middle hind leg segments. One, two, three, and so on. Number nine. The vestibular nucleus, a rather triangular structure, diamond shaped, extending down into the uh, posterior hindbrain receiving from the gravity system over here. And giving rise to descending tract, the lateral simulo spinal tract, which goes down to end on gamma, small motor fiber of the gamma system that come out and supply the striated ends of the muscle spindle system. Muscle spindle system having large cells that project into the segment and make monosynaptic connections to large anterior cells that go out to supply muscle large fibers of the same segment. This is basically, basically the system that is essential for the cerebral rigidity. We have a preparation such as I've made here with just a brain stem. The vestibular nucleus is released from a lot of inhibition. Particular formation contributes to this too, but the major system is the vestibular spinal, particular spinal coming down to the gamma motor system, making the Segmental reflexes hyperactive, specifically those for anti gravity muscles. And so you have a cat like this, and you can stand on all four legs, stiff legged. Um, you can cut the dorsal root, and the system collapses. You can 
cut down the brain stem and cut out the, the civil nucleus, and the system collapses. The very next chapter is going to have to do with the cerebellum. And stage one of the cerebellum, the clock of the nodular lobe, um, is essentially a horizontal uh, pillars, a horizontal expansion of the uh, receiver system. Uh, exaggerated here, put in the floculus, and the nodulus I'm going to pull out from the midline. Uh, cerebral cortex out there, an expansion of the vestibular system with connections between the vestibular nucleus and the the nodular cortex and intracortical connection with finally a Purkinje cell coming down to the roof nucleus. nucleus, back to the pseudo nucleus, so we have a horizontal expansion of the vestibular system, and uh, this week too, the roof nucleus here, connecting out to the pseudo nucleus, and the Purkinje cells, the vermis, connecting down to the roof nucleus, and unfortunately I use the same color as green, but uh, let's get that to the moment. Descending the cerebral spinal tract. So one has the possibility of interfering with this system, the anti-gravity reflex system, not only above the midbrain and down the brain stem, but also into the cerebellum. And it turns out, as you probably know already, that the Purkinje cells inhibit the deep cerebellar nuclei, and so you can take it. Back up, Buster. If you're operating on a cat and decerebrating, then it doesn't show a lot of anti gravity sensor terminal. You can go in and take out anterior cerebellum. In the old days, they would uh, uh, clip the vascular artery, and then at their convenience, to carotid arteries, thereby at least uh, producing large massive infarct in cerebral hemispheres and the supracerebral artery coming over here, also the intracerebellum. That made a very rigid cap. And that's because the cortex here inhibits the, that normally would inhibit the people in the case, move, you have more tone on the civil nucleus, more anti-gravity extensor tone. That briefly is why the alcoholic who has anterior Permian atrophy has a stiff legged ataxia, contrast the usually expected floppy hypertonic ataxia. So that's one of the major intersegmental systems that uh, uh, you should know about. Any problems? What is the roof nucleus again? We'll come to the roof nucleus in just a few minutes. Uh, it is the deep cerebral nucleus for the flocculonodular lobe. 
and for the verbs. Um, I can. I wanted to uh, do the rest of the city of Nippies, uh, uh, and uh, extract the movements uh, first, but just briefly, the cerebellum is made up of cortex and white matter and deep nuclei. All of the afferents come into the cerebellum and in the cortex as muscle fibers, our granule cells, Pinky cells, pinky cells, and leave the cortex to go down to the deep nucleus where they inhibit the deep nucleus. The deep nucleus is what sends out fibers stage one to the vestibular, stage two across the red nucleus and back down to the spinal tract, and stage three to the dentate, the red nucleus, thalamus, and so on. It's part of it. Big supersegmental system. Cortical, pocket, cerebellar, and pocket, and cortical. Uh, roof nucleus is the first one we've seen. Uh, and I just wanted to introduce it to show you the, the effects of the cere cerebellum, specifically the anterior cerebellum, and of the fucking natural lobe on the super nucleus and. in the spinal tract. Okay? I mean, we'll, we'll come back to the deep nuclei in more detail. There is another. Now, no more questions on, on gravity. The other vestibular afferent is from the semicircuit canals and connects the extraocular motor nuclei through a system of crossed and ipsilateral ascending and descending fibers running in the medial longitudinal fasciculus. These are primarily activated by other bipolar cells, concerning certain cells, and police, and then the civil nucleus, and use the MLF to connect the third, fourth, and sixth nuclei, and the neck muscles as well. Uh, in appropriate ways so that one maintains the gaze parallel, two eyes looking straight ahead. If one has a lesion of the MLF, What does one see clinically? You look toward the hemiplegia. Hmm? You look toward the hemiplegia. No, it's MLF now. It's not theta. MLF. MLF different from the descending, uh, from, say, from life field, coming down and crossing running laterally, lateral to the MLF. Um, here is uh, MLF. And out laterally. be the voluntary uh, mechanism for conjugate eye gaze. 
on that in another moment. But if we interrupt the intersegmental system, vestibulo ocular motor system, you get what? Ipsilateral. Failure of medial rectus to go ipsilateral medial rectus a deductor. Contralateral lateral rectus nystagmus. Conjugate gaze mechanism breaks. Can't look from the a left and the left lesion. My right eye won't. My left eye won't look to the right. My right eye will look but can't hold it. Okay. By contrast, if I have a lesion of the voluntary system, the beginning cortex runs down to the capsule takes off from the internal capsule and runs in the wall of the third ventricle, crossing at the level of the posterior commissure and descending lateral to the MLA. Anywhere involving that system, one has a paralysis of conjugate gaze in the cortex to the opposite side. If I got a left cortical lesion, I can't look to the right either eye. Left or right. If I come down and cross in the brain stem, left side of lesion, so I can't look to the lesion. Can't look to the left. The right can look to the left. Okay. You're looking down as though you're still thinking about it. So here we have uh, a conjugate gaze palsy. This is contralateral. Above the midbrain, and ipsilateral below the midbrain. And so, what happens if the lesion is just a little bit bigger? It involves both the MLF and the conjugate gaze. Well, the MLF is going to give you an ipsilateral medial rectus palsy. So this is on the left side. My medial rectus can't look to the right. My lateral rectus blocks the can't hold it. And now, if I add onto that the conjugate gaze movement palsy, I can't look to the side of the lesion, so my left eye is immobile. My right eye can't look to the left. So my left eye is immobile, my right eye can show the side on a typical right side of the hand. Right. 
Now there's a curious twist to this whole system. If you get a bilateral lesion of this conjugate agent mechanism, as by lesions back to the middle of the commissure or the walls of the third ventricle, or in pineal moments, presumably pressing on this system, you get a vertical gaze with a panel cover down. And no one has really adequately explained that. In this region of the midbrain, aqueduct, posterior commissure, one can have quite a variety of extractor motor palsies, depending on which of the systems is involved, unilaterally or bilaterally. To say nothing of adding on third or fourth nerve palsies in the third segment, So that's the, uh, the piece of the middle hindbrain that I left out the other day, trying to cut it down to an hour. Um, and um, so there we are. We've got ten minutes to fill in now. How do we use it for ten minutes? Uh, David suggests we have an exam. Um, but um, that seems too easy. Um, anything about the brain stem, spinal cord, in black like now. Sensory plate elements are spinal cord segment. <coughs> three divided most of by size. Okay, so we've got three out here. Small, medium, and large. They're all nice T-shaped elements. Small sensor of pain. The small comes out for pain temperature. Large for spindles. Medium for everything else. else. Eric, how many association plate elements do we have? Three. Where are they? elements in the dorsal horn, okay. Um, that's one. Where is the next? Where's the next one? Next association plate element. That, of course, is for small fibers. Small fibers come in. This arm track branch, draw secondary collaterals to the uh, nucleus. How about the large fiber system? What's the association plate for it? Push your column and branches across from Codley. Here's all secondary collaterals. If that were the case, how would we get a monosynaptic reflex? Is 
to have it come in. The Gomorrah Center replaced the Alpha Moon Bronze, so I stressed the tent and go. Thank you. Now that, of course, is cheating because it's not association plate. That's motor plate. So where is the association plate? Isn't there any that does go to gamma motor neurons? Sorry? Is there none that does go to gamma motor neurons? I don't think so. The gamma system is largely, not exclusively, activated by intersegmental and supersegmental. Okay. So we have to have an association plate for spindles, one of which is Clark's nucleus. So we have a secondary collateral given off the head. It's the origin of the dorsal spinal cerebral tract. And the accessory puneate nucleus of medulla, caudal medulla. So we have two essentially the same kinds of cells doing essentially the same thing, relaying spindle after messages on the cerebellum. So we have association plate for small fibers and for large fibers. And now what do we do for the medium-sized fibers? Where is their association plate? Well, we have some secondary collaterals deep into the gray matter of the ventral spinal cerebral tract. And we have the rostrally running fibers in the dorsal columns going up to nuclei of pushy columns, which would be medium-sized fiber system. And those nuclei relay on all the other sensory fibers, messages from the medial and meniscus to the optic side of the balance. And just to finish that off, we have the lateral cuneate. Which is going to receive the spindle apparatus from the upper extremity. The rostral branch, the caudal branch going down to Clark's nucleus and thoracic cord. So here we have spindle. Here we have pain temperature. Here are the yellows. And so that's basically the signal apparatus that we have for all the signals. It seems like I've heard of some other interneurons that I don't know if we've talked about. For instance, with the spindles, I thought that there were some that were disynaptic or trisynaptic. Why should we contrast laterally to inhibit the other side? Do those figure into the scheme? I'm not aware of those. So I haven't done much with my scheme. So if you could tell me something more about them, I'll put them in. I know, but I thought that the spindle would come in and cause a flexor reflex on the same side. And then it would talk about causing an extensor reflex on the opposite side. Okay, that's pain. The pain reflex. This little fiber system, wherever you have it up here, 
We have the small fibers coming in to this hour's track, marking the button of the propolis, and down to flexor motor neurons. And to the other side, extensor motor neurons. And now we have the basis for polysynaptic reflex of pain temperature for an ipsilateral withdrawal of pain and a contralateral uh, anti-gravity response, extensor. So in case you're deploying one foot, you would have a tendency to stay on the other leg line. I had somehow got the impression that there was, that not only would it um, Excite the extensors on the opposite side, but that also it would inhibit flexors on the opposite side. Is that? Uh, that uh, those go together. There's a reciprocal inhibition between flexors and extensors. So in general, when you excite one, you inhibit the other. So there's got to be some more neurons running around in there. And so there's some more neurons running around in the right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that would be a general pattern of intra-segmental organization. But in general, one does not tense everything. But you can control the amount of displacement of a joint by exciting agonists or inhibiting antagonists. Um, just as one can change the bias by exciting or inhibiting the animal to increase or decrease the excitability of the alpha motor neurons, reflex the excitement through that segment of stretch. There are, uh, well, just as in the respiratory center, um, we have in particular formation of the pressure hind brain neurons that you can record from that show that they are excited or inhibited by inhaling or exhaling. Four different kinds of neurons there. Um, one can show that there are a number of ways of exciting a particular, or activating a particular muscle. Uh, one of the neater series of experiments was done a decade ago by Jim Sprague in Philadelphia, taking this uh, decerebrum type preparation and showing that having decerebrated the cat, one could decrease the level of any extensor antigravity action by cutting um, that's plus corn. <laughs> by cutting the um, the uh, lateral particular spinal system. You can bring it back again by taking off the the anterior cerebellum increase Increasing. You could decrease it by taking off the lateral cerebellum. You could Increase it by uh, by a, a more medial lesion, like so. So finally, all they had left was the vestibular nucleus and the gamma motor system. They could abolish it by cutting across the root. That left only activation of alpha motor. There are a whole, a whole hierarchy of, of uh, segmental, intersegmental, cerebellar, in particular, formation systems that one can play with, balancing one against the other. Um, in, in the same breath. 